Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Rodman. I'm uh, with Leader Dogs for the Blind here. I'm a guide dog mobility instructor over at Leader Dogs for the Blind. Uh, so for those of you who are unaware, what the title means is essentially I spend uh, half my year training dogs to become suitable guide dog candidates. And then the other portion of my year teaching our visually impaired client base how to effectively and safely use those dogs. Uh, I've been with Leader Dogs for five years now. Um, I have a degree in um, human resources development with a specializing in training and development. Um, and I've worked with animals in some capacity for the last 15, 20 years of my life. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. All right, my name is Leslie Hoskins. I'm a certified orientation and mobility specialist as well as the outreach services and community engagement manager here at Leader Dogs for the Blind. I've been with Leader Dog coming up on seven years now, um, and I spent the first six years as an O&M instructor, and then this last year as um, the outreach manager. So I'm really enjoying this new role and getting to spread all the word and great things that Leader Dog does with everybody. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you today and to share some of this information. We'll get started, of course, with a puppy on the screen. So on the screen right now is a black lab puppy and the puppy is wearing a blue bandana that says future leader dog. Um, and it's got a little paw print on it too. So as Alaya mentioned, we will have hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. And hopefully, here we go. All right. So today we're going to discuss the pros and cons of different mobility tools, including a cane and guide dog. We'll provide information about O&M and guide dog training options, as well as some program requirements. And that does include the International Guide Dog Federation standards for guide dog applicants. So Eric will really get into those later on in the program. But we're excited to talk about the difference um, between cane travel and guide dog and really help you decide, hopefully, um, if it's you personally trying to figure out which mode or, of travel is going to be best for you, or if you're helping a client or a student um, or a family member, you know, kind of weigh the pros and cons of each mobility option. All right, so to get us started, for those of you who aren't familiar with Leader Dog, we are a nonprofit organization located in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Uh, we were established in 1939, and we work every day towards our mission of empowering people who are blind or visually impaired with lifelong skills for safe and independent daily travel. We have a beautiful 14-acre campus um, with 34 residence rooms and a canine development center that has the potential to hold over 300 dogs. It typically does not have that many dogs in it. However, it does have the capability to hold that many dogs at one time if need be. Um, Leader Dog does not receive any federal or state funding and receives no payments from insurance companies. So Leader Dog relies on voluntary contributions to fulfill our mission. All of our services at Leader Dogs for the Blind are completely free to our clients, and that does include room, board, and travel. So we actually will pay for clients to fly to Rochester or to Detroit, Michigan, and we'll pick them up at the airport um, and then bring them to our lovely campus here. So on the screen here, there's a picture of a gentleman uh, wearing sunglasses and he's walking his leader dog who is a yellow lab. And they're kind of on like a walking path or a sidewalk and both the handler and the guide dog are looking at the camera or towards the camera. So we're gonna start out first by discussing cane travel and how it works. It sounds like many of you are in the field so you're very familiar with this but we'll just kind of break it down as much as we possibly can. So the long white cane is a mobility tool to help someone who is visually impaired navigate the environment safely. This cane is thought to be an extension of the user's body and interprets the ground ahead by sweeping or tapping back and forth as the user walks. The cane will sometimes pop up or get stuck when it encounters a crack and this tells the user that she, he or she should probably pick up their feet in the next coming step to avoid tripping. The cane provides different sound feedback that helps the user interpret information about the environment so for example, if it's a larger or smaller room, if you're walking down a hallway, if there's um, an opening or a room, things like that. The cane also assists the user in identifying objects within the user's path by finding the object with the cane and not the user's body. So as o and instructors, I'm sure all of you um, have said many times, we love to see our clients with really beat up canes because that typically tells us that their body is not beat up, but their cane is. So it's doing the, doing the job. Um, 
So cane travel is very tactile mode of travel. It interprets uh, what's going on around you, about the movements and the feeling within the cane. So on the screen here, we do have a picture of a young female walking on a sidewalk uh, with her cane. So I briefly want to talk about some of the pros and cons of using a, a long white cane. And, you know, these are going to be unique to every individual. Um, but some of maybe the cons or the stigmas of using a cane are that people can identify that the individual has a disability, right? So when somebody's walking with a kit, they're very clearly identified as someone who cannot see. Uh, sometimes other people tend to shy away from cane users because they're nervous or they don't really know what to do or how to interact or how to help. Many times people assume that a cane user needs help or assistance. How many times have we heard from our clients that uh, somebody just comes up and kind of grabs their arm and takes them and starts walking or things like that? Um, and it's, it's one more thing to carry around. I guess you can consider that a negative. Some of the positives, though, of using a cane are that people do know you are visually impaired. So it's a great identifier when you're out traveling. So People may understand if you're at the grocery store and you accidentally bump into somebody or knock something over, that cane really helps um, identify the person as visually impaired and helps kind of ex explain those situations. Or if somebody's waving at you from across the store and that individual doesn't say hi, having a cane helps identify and say, oh, okay, maybe they can't see me waving or they don't know who I am. Um, Another positive or pro of having a cane is that it really does give an opportunity to advocate for themselves and others with a visual impairment. So letting, you know, a lot of times if you're out with an individual using a cane and kids are always super interested in canes and want to know more and sometimes are, are looking, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about it a little bit and explain a lot of times people who are using a cane still may have some remaining vision. That's one of those biggest myths out there. Um, that people don't understand. So really being an advocate for, uh, for the community. And then of course, most importantly, the best thing about using a cane is that it's gonna help you travel safely, right? So it's, it's a mobility tool that's assisting you or whoever getting around and navigating the environment safely. So as you can see, some of the cons are pros and pros are cons. It really depends on your outlook um, of how you perceive things in traveling with a cane. But one of the biggest things and points we want to talk about here with cane travel in comparison to guide dog travel is that it is a very, very tactile way to travel. You're really um, using the cane to interpret things that are going on in the environment around you and to, and to make those decisions. So on the screen here, you'll see a gentleman who is walking on a sidewalk with his long cane and then behind him are two female O&M instructors. And I'm going to hand it over to Eric now to talk about the dog. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Eric again. And we we'll get down into the dog portion of this presentation. Um, so uh, we're going to get into talking about guide dog travel, um, just so that we can now look at it uh, in comparison with uh, cane travel. And, um, you know, and this will help to for you to decide, or maybe some of you may be working with to decide whether or not a guide dog would be a good fit in your life. Um, we'll start off by saying the main objective of guide dog travel is for, or for the, the guide dog itself, is to stop at all curbs or changes in elevation and to guide around obstacles. Um, handlers usually use the feeling and the movement of the dog's harness to follow the guide dog around obstacles such as trash can, cans, benches, crowds of people, and more. Um, the dog is also, also responsible for stopping uh, the handler at the curb when approaching an intersection. We want to keep in mind though, that orientation and determining when to cross the street are both the handler's responsibilities. Um, and this is something that we stress to our clients all the time that this, we, we call them teams for a reason um, because there needs to be effort on both sides. Um, these dogs are very well trained and, and capable of doing wonderful things, but one thing they can't do is tell you when it's safe to cross the street. Uh, and so that, that's something that falls upon the handler. Um, so the handler definitely would analyze the intersection and de determine the appropriate time to cross um, and then give the dog the forward command to initiate movement. Uh, similarly, the handler is responsible for orientation and navigating to the desired location. Um, there's always an ongoing dad joke with clients that this is an Uber. You can't just grab your dog and say, we're going to the grocery store and then pull your phone out and start checking Instagram and whatnot. You need to be present. You need to be you know, keeping your orientation and directing the dog turn by turn 
providing that uh, providing that direction. Uh, and on the uh, on the slide here, we have a picture of a beautiful German Shepherd in harness water, working with one of our uh, guide dog mobility instructors. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about pros and cons, just, just like uh, working with a cane, obviously uh, working with a dog has uh, some challenges and it has some upsides as well too. Uh, so we'll start with the positive sides. Um, and obviously one of the big selling points of a guide dog is companionship. Um, they're loyal. Uh, we breed very willing dogs, uh, especially the breeds we use, Labradors, Goldens, German Shepherds. Um, they, all, uh, they all are very willing to please their handler. Um, and because of access and everything, they get to go with, with you wherever you travel. Um, so companionship is definitely a big, big selling point there. Um, guide dogs do encourage social interaction. This can be a pro or a con, depending on how you feel about social interaction. I know nowadays with uh, safe distancing and all that from, uh, from one another, um, but you know, guide dogs are going to encourage social interaction because people love to approach dogs, ask questions, what's his name, what's he doing, what's that harness on his back? Um, so they're going to kind of spur some conversation. Another pro is uh, guide dogs nav navigate around obstacles. Uh, so whereas, you know, Leslie mentioned the canes, the canes function is to detect obstacles, giving you that tactile feedback. Um, a guide dog is going to simply guide around. So you may not even be aware of the obstacles presence um, while traveling with one. Um, another one is that guide dogs travel faster, especially once they're patterned. Um, it's much more efficient for travel in an open or complex area because you can teach the dog to pattern to specific walkways or to target specific landmarks or objects. So it can make travel in open and complex areas a little more efficient. Um, and also traffic safety. Um, so the dog does provide an extra measure of traffic safety. Again, like I mentioned earlier, um, the student though has to provide and make those safe judgments of when it's safe to, to initiate a street crossing. Um, we do, teach our dogs a concept called intelligent disobedience. Um, and we usually use this when we're doing any kind of um, advanced obstacle training or when we do our traffic training. And it essentially instills in the dog um, a uh, what, situation in which the dog will intelligently disobey the command being given to it because there is something in the path of travel that the handler probably needs to investigate or needs to check out before they proceed moving. Okay, uh, so we'll look on the on the con side or the downside. Um, first off is going to be uh, what we call parking. Uh, it's just our our lovely term for picking up after your dog. Um, there will be lots of cleanup uh, at home and out when you're out and about. Um, dogs may have accidents, and trash cans aren't always conveniently placed when you're out working with a guide dog. Um, I know as a guide dog trainer, I've had to carry a bag of poop with me for blocks <laughs> and whatnot. So it's a reality that you may face at some point um, and that you always have to have cleanup supplies on you. It's just, you know, it's better to have it and not need it than the other way around. Grooming, um, obviously we're gonna wanna make sure uh, that we are grooming our dogs on a daily basis, um, but this is going to lead to inevitably having dog hair in the house, in your car, on your clothes. Um, in particular, in regards to ADA regulations, we stress this with our clients a lot that grooming is very important because under the ADA, uh, two reasons why a service animal and its handler can be asked to leave a public place is that um, either one, the dog is not behaving pro properly um, in regards to social behaviors, or the dog is not properly groomed and smells and, and, and looks disheveled. So we just encourage our clients to get into a daily uh, routine of grooming their dogs. Again, unwanted social interaction. Um, here around Rochester Hills, we're very fortunate that a lot of people know about leader dog and they know about guide dogs and what they do. So they're pretty respectful about giving us space. They're not bothering clients and stuff. But when you get out and about, not a lot of people know about guide dogs and their function and what they're doing. And so a lot of people will come right up and pet them, say hi, give them food out of their hand, things like that. Um, so there can be some unwanted social interaction that um, you know, handlers don't plan for. Uh, financial expenses are something to consider. Uh, medical care, both routine and emergency, uh, we'll kind of get into it 
a little bit later, but um, you know, expenses as, as far as food, vet bills, shots, vaccinations, preventatives, all that stuff kind of needs to be factored in to make sure that you can financially uh, you know, afford to take care of uh, the leader dog. Um, daily care, again, we've kind of talked about, um, you know, a dog's not like a cane. You can't just put the dog in the closet when you're done using it. You know what I mean? That dog is, is you know, usually becomes part of the family and needs to be taken care of. And, you know, you have to think, do I want to stand outside at 630 in the morning every morning with a poop bag in my hand uh, when it's, you know, February in Michigan? You know, that's the reality of being a guide dog handler is that you need to do that for the sake of the dog. Um, they need that consistency of schedule. Um, as well as getting out every day and working to keep the dog's guide dog's skills sharp. Um, and again, like we talked about the grooming and obedience and all kinds of other things that you should be doing on a daily basis to make sure the dog, your dog's staying in tip top shape. Um, for the you know, clients that have had dogs for a few years, um, retirement and uh, the passing of dogs is unfortunately just kind of comes with the territory. Um, and that you know, our, our return clients must eventually transition to new dogs or make a retirement plan for their current dog. Um, we provide for our clients that come on campus uh, what we call transitions, which is a session that is um, hosted by some of our certified counselors here um, to talk about you know, the grief process and talk about you know, all those emotions that come with um, letting go of that old dog and remembering it fondly, but okay, now I need to, you know, clear my mind and I'm approaching this new situation with a new dog and new expectations. Um, and then finally, the, the commitment. A guide dog is, is, is not something you want to jump into willy nilly. This is a seven to 10 year commitment um, that you want to make sure that is something you want to do. And uh, you should, you know, definitely weigh all of this information that we're kind of giving you here today. To, to think whether or not this is uh, something you want to commit to for the next decade, or where will you be seven to 10 years from now? And will a guide dog be the best fit for your life? Um, and on this slide here, we have a gentleman wa uh, working his dog. Uh, it's a handsome little uh, yellow lab in harness down the sidewalk. They're both facing towards the camera here, just kind of rocking and rolling down the sidewalk here. So this next slide, we're going to kind of get into cane versus dog, and we've kind of got them uh, side by side here. So I'll kind of go bullet for bullet um, in relation to one another so we can kind of compare the two. Okay. The first point being, like I kind of said, a cane can be left in the corner um, while a guide dog has to go out every day, um, not only just for relief and some play, but again, to go out and, and uh, get that harness work in so that the dog is practicing and keeping its skills sharp. Um, Leslie talked about tactile and non-tactile traveling. Um, again, um, you know, the guide dog removes some of that tactile feedback that you would, you know, normally be receiving from the white cane. And, and how does that affect somebody who's traveling um, if they normally rely a lot on a lot of that information to keep their orientation in the environment? Uh, maintenance, canes are obviously a lot more uh, low maintenance than, uh, than guide dogs. Uh, you know, and don't require a lot of cleanup. Um, the social interaction, again, like I said, uh, you know, tends to be higher end on the guide dog side, lower on the, lower on the cane side. Uh, guide dog, our dogs just typically, like I said, tend to draw social attention when out and about working. Um, and of course, the uh, the cost of a cane so is usually a less than around fifty dollars um, and lasts quite a bit of time, whereas a guide dog we say on average, can average anywhere around $1,000 a year, that's give or take, um, to cover food, vet bills, again, preventative, and all other um, supplies you would need for the dog. And then companionship. Um, we talked about one of the biggest selling points of the, of the guide dog is that, you know what I mean, that's, that's your buddy. And I, again, we breed very willing dogs here that only want to please and do their best to, to make their handlers happy. So um, as you can see, there's, there's many things to, to consider and think about on deciding what's the best mobility tool. Um, you kind of want to weigh your options, you know, uh, evaluate your lifestyle and, and your financial capabilities when you're considering the two options. Um, there is no definitive answer. You know what I mean? It, it, that is something that uh, the, the individual user needs to kind of come to the conclusion of whether or not a dog is, is the right fit in their life or the, the best mobility tool for their life, so. 
All right, we'll move around and move on to our uh, required O and M skills here for our. Uh, these are the required skills that we look for uh, for our potential guide dog users, people applying to the guide dog program. Um, again, confidence in independent travel. Um, so we want to be able to see independent travel within their home area. A uh, leader dog requests a minimum of one mile per day and uh, must be familiar enough with home environment to do so, including various street crossings. We're going to get into that later. I'll be talking about our application process. Um, but we like to get video of um, our applicants traveling in their home area so that we're able to kind of see um, firsthand in real time how they, how they do that. Second would be orientation and reorientation. Um, must be able to reorient in new environments or, or if they have lost their way. Um, a big thing here is problem solving. Um, and we'll, again, we'll talk about this in the videos, um, but we encourage people if when they're applying and they're making, they're putting their videos together and stuff, leave all the mistakes. And we don't want the pretty fluffy edited video that's got all the transitions and looks. No, I want, we want to be able to see your ability to problem solve, use the environmental information and make good decisions to get, get yourself back on track. Um, Next would be tactile, traveling without tactile feedback. Uh, again, we touched on this about, you know, the, the guide dog removes a lot of that tactile feedback that the cane normally provides because um, the dog will normally just kind of guide around those obstacles or landmarks. The best way that we go about practicing this, um, especially early in class before we issue dogs to our clients is we conduct what we call Juno walks. And we basically simulate a dog walk by using a empty uh, dog harness and having the client hold onto the handle of the harness. And we simulate the movements of the dog and we're able to kind of judge um, how, the, how the student does um, without having use again of the cane there and only being able to use the feet um, you know, for curbs and detecting changes in elevation and things like that. Uh, traffic responsibility, we've touched on this already, but analyzing intersections, determining traffic patterns, um, and executing safe street crossings. Again, we try to do this in Juno um, with our students before getting their dogs as we, we do a little bit of assessing ourselves just to you know kind of get to the corner while we're doing the simulated dog walk and say, okay, you know what I mean? Uh, you tell me when you think it's safe to cross or if we're doing human guide, just give me a squeeze on the arm and let me know. Um, but those are good ways to practice you know, before incorporating a young energetic dog into the equation. Um, some other skills that uh, we touch on, uh, voice intonation. So dogs respond much more to voice intonation than to words or commands. We train them on verbal commands, but um, being able for a client to have some different inflection in their voice to be able to give a, um, who's a good puppy, a nice praise voice when a dog does a great job and stops for an obstacle or guides you around an obstacle, versus a no, leave it when the dog, you know, inevitably picks up a stick up off the sidewalk and looks up at you all proud of itself because it did so. Um, the next would be what we call cutback turns or cutback turns, excuse me. Um, so our dogs are, tra are trained to travel curb to curb, um, best way to for our clients to keep their orientation and so the dog can reach curb to curb to curb, um, and 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 that way they you can keep track of where you're at and you're out. Um, we don't like the dogs to make shortcuts, so even if you know you need to make a right at the corner, we want you to still go straight down to that street corner, and then turn back around to make that and cut onto that intersecting sidewalk that would then be behind you. Um, we don't want to start making shortcuts because then the dogs start guessing, and then they start taking shortcuts, and it can lead to problems down the road. And then essentially dog responsibility. Um, is the student willing to keep up, continue to keep up cane skills? Um, dog can't go everywhere. Unfortunately, dogs get a lot of access rights, but they, are, they don't get access to every single place. Um, but we want students to continue keeping up their cane skills. Um, there used to be kind of a, um, an attitude back in the day. Uh, I, I, I've heard stories, I should say, of people coming in to get dogs and they would say, okay, you're coming to get your dog. Here's a bin, throw your cane in. You don't need that cane anymore. Well, thankfully the mindset has changed around here. And we realize that the guide dog is another mobility tool. They're wonderful, beautiful creatures. We love them to death, but they're also, it's also a mobility tool, just like a cane. And why wouldn't I want to have all the tools at my disposal 
So we always tell clients to carry their canes with them, even when they're out with their dogs, in case they get in trouble and they need to problem solve and whatnot. So we wanna make sure that people are keeping up with their cane skills on top of practicing their dog skills as well. Okay, we're gonna move on. I think slide 10 here, these are questions to ask yourself. If you're thinking about a guide dog or questions to consider, um, if you're working with someone who is considering to uh, get, a, get a guide dog, uh, and again, I can't give you the answer yes or no if a guide dog's the right fit for you, but these are things for you to ponder. Um, so I'm just going to rattle off a bunch of questions here, and these are these are good things to kind of to kind of mull over. Okay. First off, we talk about in, independent cane traveler. Uh, does the student only do the minimum independent travel required to get from class to class, or are they motivated to, to develop independent routes to destinations? Um, do they have good orientation skills? The ability to maintain orientation, is it only present in familiar areas or can they maintain orientation in unfamiliar areas? Um, can they remain oriented in open areas without the ability to shoreline? Um, or can they remain oriented in both indoor and outdoor environments? Um, functional vision uh, requirements vary among the schools on the amount of functional vision that uh, is acceptable. Uh, vision loss must meet federal standards for legal blindness and the person must use a primary primary mobility aid to be considered for admission uh, for our school. Uh, traveling and weather, especially important for people living in climates with long, harsh winters, um, i.e. Michigan. Uh, we, we travel in all types of weather in class, rain or shine. Uh, we tell the clients that, you know what I mean, uh, the world doesn't stop because of a little bit of rain. So we need to make, you know, we need to get out and practice in those kind of conditions. Um, and, you know, usually people, by the time they get out there and get their feet away a little bit, then they're having a great time um, with it. Um, next, uh, emotional maturity and psychological stability. Um, can, they, uh, can they handle their function under stressful conditions and in a residential dormitory setting with shared meals, classes, and transportation? Uh, that pertains specifically to clients who come here on campus to Leader Dog to stay for training. Um, which is our three-week um, residential training here that we do uh, in Rochester. Um, are there any diagnosed mental illnesses and are they under good control? Um, can they choose appropriate topics for conversation in a group of people of varying ages, demographics, and physical capabilities? Um, our guide dog classes tend to draw people from all walks of life, all ages, all nationalities, um, all different cultures. So we get a wonderful blend of people here and everything, but we just wanna make sure that people can get along and we have a nice respectful atmosphere, respectful and cooperative. Cause it is, it is stressful at the end of the day, but uh, it is also rewarding and, and enjoyable. Um, some additional questions to consider um, is the, uh, you know, cognitive ability. So ability to remembering, you know, when and how much to feed and water a dog um, when it needs to be taken out to uh, unleash to be relieved? Um, is a student able to regulate or maintain a consistent schedule in personal life, whether in school or on summer break? Um, because again, the dog is going to rely on consistency and some form of schedule in order to be, um, to stay healthy and in the best shape. Dogs, dogs love consistency, they're creatures of habit. Um, so keeping to a schedule and keeping to a routine is what's gonna be most beneficial for that dog. Um, the physical components um, determining, you know, how is stamina? Are, there, are clients able to handle long days, routes of at least six blocks twice per day? Um, what about arm strength to a, control a large young dog? Um, we do our best to match dogs that uh, will be easily to, you know, easy to handle and control, um, but they are about a year and a half old when they come out of their, uh, the end of training here. And uh, you know, a year and a half to old dog does get excited from time to time and they can be strong. Um, and also the ability to bend down and pick up after your dog. So there are some physical requirements that need to be considered. Um, next is a big one here is why, why do you want a guide dog? What, what's the reasoning for wanting a guide dog? Um, you know, because I, we, we've heard many different reasons um, and you know, some of those good reasons would be you know bridging bridging any kind of social gap, increased increased efficiency in navigating around obstacles or traveling in a complex environment, um, or some desire for independence when you're transitioning to college or a new 
uh, a new environment or anything. Um, some reasons we've heard that probably aren't the best reasons of why you should consider to get a dog is that, you know, either a family or a friend thinks that it's going to be the best fit and will fix all your problems. Um, or sometimes people get the misconception that um, it's just going to automatically make mobility easier or that if there's some sort of skill deficiency or skill gap that, um, you know, they, they will, uh, the dog will compensate for that. Uh, we like to say you have to keep your skills in tip top shape because if you're, if you're lacking in a certain area in skills, whether it's street crossings or maintaining a uh, straight line or whatever it is, putting a young uh, energetic dog in your hands is only going to complicate things and, and make it and make it harder to do so. Um, and then, or just a general liking dogs. Um, people just say, I love dogs. That's why I want to get one. Well, you would need to consider all the options. And if, if the dog is truly going to enhance your mobility and enhance your, your, your life here. Um, family school support. Um, are they, you know, is there a safe and supportive environment around the, uh, the, the applicant? Um, this is in regards to financial assistance and caring for the dog, um, being aware of the lifestyle impact. Like I said, the daily, it's a, it's a daily um, routine of taking the dog out, feeding the dog, taking care of the dog, having the dog with you when you travel. Um, you know, all these things impact many different areas of your life. So it's, it's things to consider. Um, the willingness to assist in, in learning how to pattern a new dog to a new environment. Um, so, you know, it takes a little while to kind of transition a dog to a new environment. And we, we, we kind of walk our students through how to do that properly, but you need to be willing to put the time in to do the baby steps with the dog. Um, and then independent daily living skills, um, you know, must have good hygiene. Uh, we require that clients don't require assistance with medication um, because considerations are if, the, if a student or client can't maintain their own physical appearance, hygiene, or medication, are they going to be able to take care of a dog on top of that? Um, because again, the dog is adding more responsibility to their plate. Um, so those are those are some things to consider or just questions to ask yourself and ponder if you're yourself thinking about getting a dog or somebody you know is, is kind of thinking on making that decision. So I think next we're going to be turning it over to Leslie, who's going to be going over our O&M training. All right. So whether someone chooses a cane or a guide dog as their mobility device, it's a completely individual choice. All of those things Eric was talking about have to be, you know, analyze each person for themselves to really make the best decision. So, but what we do know is that whether you're choosing a cane or a guide dog, the first place you're going to start is with orientation and mobility training. So learning how to travel with the cane safely. We're fortunate that Leader Dogs for the Blind offers free orientation and mobility training. In January of 2002, Leader Dogs started our very own orientation and mobility program to help individuals increase skills and meet their goals of traveling independently. So whether that's with a cane or a guide dog. So the best thing about our program, our o and program, is that clients do not have to be interested in uh, a guide dog in order to attend the o and program. So if somebody just wants to be a great independent cane traveler, that's a good reason to come in for our o and program. Our o and program, unlike the guide dog program, does not have any skill requirements. So many times we're giving a client their very first cane ever, and other times we're working with clients who have had, you know, years of practice with a cane. It doesn't really matter. We can meet each client at their independent skill level. Our orientation and mobility program is a one-week residential program with one-on-one -on -one instruction from a certified orientation and mobility specialist. So another great thing about the o and week is that typically clients receive anywhere between 25 and 30 hours of direct instruction during that time. Um, it's nice because when clients come for our o and program on our campus, they don't have the stresses of other responsibilities. So they're not worrying about work typically or family or, or pets or anything like that. They're really there to focus or here to focus on their cane skills. And so it ends up really being 25 to 30 hours which we know, you know, if you're getting O&M itinerant model, sometimes that could take months and months and months to require or to acquire that much independent training. So it is nice to really um, work with other O&M specialists. So ideally, you know, somebody might come to us and we kind of teach them the basic skills and then send them back home to work with an O&M instructor in their home environment 
to generalize those skills to their, their specific routes and intersections and things like that. So it's nice when we can have a team approach and really collaborate with other O&M instructors out there because we know we're not a one-stop shop. We can't fix everything. We can't teach everything, um, especially with it being a residential program. So the ultimate goal here is to really collaborate, work with other O&M instructors and receive kind of that big uh, 25, 30 hours of direct instruction, get the general skills, the fundamental skills, and then hopefully go home and generalize those with another O&M professional. Our O&M program is available to anyone who is 16 years or older. And again, it's completely free to our clients. So that does include airfare to and from our campus. So on the screen here, we have a picture of a young female client. She is traveling across a street and with, with her white cane and with her uh, behind her is a female O&M instructor. So we found through our O&M program that it's really helpful for us to kind of break it up into a couple of different models. So we know that ultimately the week of O&M is going to be completely individualized for each client and, to, and really based on what their goals are. Um, so typically on Monday when a client arrives, we sit down, we talk about what your goals are, what you want to get out of the week, and then we kind of really individualize what we're going to do that week together. But what's really been helpful we found is helping clients apply through this is that breaking it up into a couple of different options. This one does help us get an idea as to what the client's goals are, but also let clients know what all we can offer. So the, th uh, the four programs or training options that we've come up with are introduction to O&M. So this is a really good option for somebody who's never traveled with a cane before, is maybe just starting to think about it, not sure. Um, exactly if they're ready, um, that type of thing. One thing I will say is that all clients who do come to Leader Dog for O&M will receive a free cane. So we give all of our clients a free cane and then we have numerous cane tips for everybody to try in a variety of environments to really decide what works for them. You know, oftentimes we're referring to cane tips as kind of like shoes, you know, to the beach, wear flip-flops, to the gym, you're gonna wear tennis shoes, to, to date night, you might wear heels or something like that. So cane tips are kind of the same thing, very interchangeable. So we like to give everybody an opportunity to test them all out and decide what's gonna work best for them. Our second option is O&M brush up. So this is gonna be a really good option for somebody who's maybe had O&M training, but it's been 10, 15 years, or maybe since they've had training, their vision has changed or their physical ability has changed. Maybe they've moved environments. So numerous reasons for own and brush up. One of them could be that you've been traveling with a guide dog for the last five years. And all of a sudden you're like, oh no, I need to brush up on my cane skills. Maybe your dog's getting ready to retire. Or maybe you're just noticing that your cane skills are dwindling a bit. As Eric mentioned, those are really important skills to maintain throughout your guide dog travel. Our third option is guide dog readiness. This is a really good option for somebody who's thinking about a guide dog. You know, we know Eric talked about how important O&M skills are. This is a great program to come and really learn about realistic expectations of traveling with a guide dog and if it's going to be the right fit for you. One of the best things about this program is coming to campus and ideally in a non-COVID world, being on campus with other guide dog um, clients and or other O&M clients. So to ask those questions and kind of observe what our clients are going through as they are getting their dog, um, it's a really great time to, to just kind of observe, ask questions, be involved. It helps make those decisions of if that's going to be the right move for you moving forward. I will say that participation in our guide dog readiness program, our O&M program, does not guarantee acceptance into uh, our guide dog program. However, you will leave that class knowing uh, what to work on and the skills that you need to, uh, in order to be accepted for a guide dog. So we always want people to leave with realistic expectations um, and exactly what they need to work on in order to achieve their goal. Our last option is advanced O&M. And this is kind of what we're considering um, for somebody who's frequently traveling, maybe you fly a lot for work or travel and you're constantly having to evaluate new intersections and new environments and hotels and things like that. Or maybe you're thinking about incorporating some technology into your travel, really just wanting to take that cane travel to the next level. So again, these kind of program options are just to give clients an idea of what we have to offer. And again, gives us an idea of what their goals are. But ultimately that week of O&M is going to be completely individualized. So it may end up being a little bit of brush up, a little bit of guide dog readiness, 
um, and, and some, some others in between, right? So it's going to be completely dependent on what that client's goals are in the current level of travel that they're coming in with. And of course, we have our guide dog travel, um, our guide dog training that we offer. And so if you're, this is something that you want to pursue is guide dog training, then hopefully you've completed some orientation and mobility, whether it be here at Leader Dog or at home or a little bit of both. Um, it's really important in order to transition to a guide dog. So as previously mentioned, numerous o &M skills are required to be accepted for a guide dog. But of course, mainly we want everyone to be successful. So it's important that everybody have realistic expectations. Our guide dog travel is very unique training, and it just so happens that we are, of course, uh, most known for our guide dog training. This is when clients are specifically matched by our guide dog mobility instructors, such as Eric, um, with a guide dog to fit their needs. So our GDMIs take the matching process very seriously and try to look at all aspects of a client's life. So some of the things that are taken into consideration are a client's pace, their travel environment that they're traveling in a home, and any other unique traits to the person. Um, our guide dog mobility instructors are wonderful at kind of looking at the whole picture of an applicant at their file, and maybe somebody lives on a farm and that the dog's going to be around large animals. So what our GDMIs are going to do are they're going to take some dogs out to that environment and see you know, if this dog can handle that or if they're a little skittish around those big animals. Again, really to kind of navigate this process and find the best dog for each individual client. So sometimes our application process does take a little bit longer um, to find somebody a dog, but it, it's so important that we find somebody the right dog and not just a dog. So on the screen here is a picture of a woman and she's beaming in the sunlight and smiling and with her is a black lab. Um, kind of in harness and he's kind of looking right at the camera. So similar to our O&M program, we've also broken up our guide dog training into a couple of different options because we know it's not a one size fits all. Everybody kind of needs something different um, to fit, fit their needs. So we've got the on-campus training, which Eric has talked about briefly. This is our on-campus three-week residential program. And it's, it's great because it gets away from home distraction. So the bonding of you with a dog or a client with a dog is so important. And sometimes it's easier to do that in a different environment. So when you're not at home with your kids or other pets or spouses or work responsibilities and things like that, when you're on campus here, you can just solely focus on you and your guide dog and learning and training together. So the on-campus um, training is a great option, especially if it's your first dog. You're going to get the most time with our guide dog mobility instructors because it's going to be three weeks. You're also going to get that peer support from other people who are going through the same process to kind of, you know, problem solve out loud or talk about what's working for them or what's not working and really just making connections too that hopefully will carry on outside of training so that you know, down the road, you can call and talk through different things or share fun stories about what's happened with you and your dog out in the, out in the world. The on-campus pro program is also a great option because you do have the support of our o &M team here on campus. So if there were any questions about analyzing intersections and things like that, we're here to support. Um, and of course, I always have to mention that the food is great. So you will never go hungry here on campus. Um, you will definitely have wonderful food the entire time. Another option is our in-home delivery. So for those who can't be away from home for three weeks, that's a long time to ask people to, to be on campus. Maybe you have fa uh, family commitments or work commitments or health issues that deter you from being away from home that time. We can also do an in-home delivery. And this is when a guide dog mobility instructor would come and bring a dog to the client's house and typically spend up to 10 days with an individual working on their specific routes and their specific travel environment. Um, it's a nice time to really get a fully one-on-one -on -one attention. So during our on-campus uh, training, it's usually a ratio of one instructor to three or four clients. The in-home is gonna be one-on-one. -on -one. So while it is shorter, 10 days, it's gonna be all one-on-one -on -one attention. Our third option is a flex program. And this really does combine the top two options. So it's kind of a perfect, uh, combination for some people. 
if you can't be away from home for the entire three weeks, but maybe you can be away from home for two weeks, spend two weeks on campus and then get some follow-up support in your home area. So again, it's really kind of a combination of those in home and on campus. And our last program is our deaf blind program. And this is a three week training that takes place on Leader Dogs campus and is specifically for clients who are deaf blind, typically communicating with American Sign Language, uh, whether that's gonna be visual or tactile. Also, this program is on a much smaller ratio, so either one to one or two to one. Uh, and there are times when our dogs are dual trained to, to indicate of some different things such as the doorbell or phone ringing and things like that. The dogs can sometimes be dual trained to alert our clients to those types of things. So those are kind of the four training options that we offer for our guide dogs. Um, and on the screen here is a gentleman uh, in a leader dog and harness walking on a college campus. And it's a yellow leader dog, yellow lab leader dog. Hi, Leslie and Eric, this is Olaya. I just wanted to jump in real quickly. Um, just uh, if you're gonna read something from a, from like a, a document or a script, just, uh, just uh, slow your pace down a little bit for the captioner to make sure that she's able to get it all in for um, those who need the captioning. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, this is Eric again. Uh, I'm just gonna do a quick, uh, a quick deep dive, if you would, into um, how we go about training our dogs. Um, so the way we have it currently structured um, is that our dogs go through a 16 week uh, training phase or a training progression. Um, and that's broken up into four phases. So when the dogs come back uh, around a year old from their puppy raisers, um, you know, our volunteers who graciously raise um, them to about a year old, um, we start the first phase of training, which is just kind of teaching them the basics. And then we expand from there until that advanced phase of training that Leslie was talking about, where we really tailor the dog um, specifically to the client that we have in mind for that dog. So whether the, you know, whether it needs to be exposed to large livestock or needs to work in, you know, downtown Detroit and be on the people mover in the queue line and get used to some public transportation or whether it needs to get used to, um, you know, uh, being around other dogs in the home and everything. We, we have to consider all the kind of specifics regarding the match. Um, throughout training, we do have um, some mandated blindfolded evaluations that we conduct with the dogs. They usually start about at the midway point, and then there is one at the at the final um, at the end of the training phase where we can deem the dog is class ready or ready to work with a client. Um, and these are routes where the, we will take the dogs out and do a twenty to thirty to forty minute route under blindfold uh, with one of the other instructors as a spotter. And we can kind of proof and see where the dog is at um, and what areas we need to work on and what areas we need to fine tune um, to get them to be those good, reliable um, candidates. I think next we'll move into, uh, we're gonna talk about, next we're gonna talk about IGDF. Um, and essentially it's just, uh, that is the International Guide Dog Federation. Um, Leader Dog is a member of IGDF. Um, and what it is, is that's kind of the governing body that looks over all the, um, the guide dog schools that are member schools. Um, and IGDF is what helps kind of set the standard for all its members. Um, and that not just on the dog side of making sure that we're producing reliable quality dogs, but also um, taking a look at uh, the level of instruction and the quality of, quality of instruction that we're providing. Um, so these standards that, that have been developed um, are, have also, they've also developed standards for reviewing applicants and what our admissions committee is looking for when reviewing an application um, for a guide dog. Um, so we'll get into the admissions committee here in a minute, um, but these are the industry set standards that are passed down to, uh, to us here. So the first of which would be motivation to train and work with a guide dog team in the long term. Again, we've kind of touched on how um, the guide dog is a you know, several year commitment. Uh, ability to achieve and maintain the leadership role in the person guide dog relationship. So again, the dog is not an Uber. It's not just going to take you to your destination. You need to be able to provide direction um, and, and get, you know, provide commands to get that dog to go to where you want to go. Physical ability to manage a large breed dog. Um, 
our dogs can range anywhere from 45 to 85 pounds. Um, you know, and again, we try to factor that all in into the matching process um, so that we're not giving a small elderly woman some 85 pound shepherd that wants to go sprinting down the sidewalk. We, we factor that in, um, but there needs to be, you know, again, a, the physical ability to be able to, to manage a year and a half old dog. Um, functional orientation to the routes and destinations that the person will use. Um, that's consistent orientation with no, no assistance. Um, problem solving skills, like we talked about in the video, and the ability to reorient self with minimal to no assistance. Um, independent street crossings at stop controlled and light controlled intersections. And again, this is all stuff that um, we, we like to see in the video that is submitted with the application for a guide dog. Uh, the next point would be sufficient work for the guide dog to maintain its safe guiding skills. So a minimum of three established routes that are regularly, regularly traveled without assistance. Uh, physical stamina, uh, a minimum of two square blocks at a minimum of two miles per hour. That's the industry standard. Um, I doubt anybody's out there with a radar gun clocking our clients, but that's, that's the number they gave us at least. Um, Vision loss that can cause the person to be dependent on a primary mobility aid. Um, again, uh, meets federally regulated legal blindness standards. Um, ability to independently cross streets, we touched on that. A positive home environment. Again, we, we require that when um, applicants apply for a guide dog that they send video um, and references so that we can see the home environment and make sure that it's a safe place for a dog to be placed. Um, and then access to required resources to maintain the guide dog's ongoing health and temperamental well-being. So again, being able to financially provide um, for vet care and keep making sure the dog is staying healthy and well-maintained. Um, one thing to note when you're researching different guide dog organizations, um, it's strongly suggested to look into or apply to organizations that are accredited through IGDF um, because that means that there is somebody holding them accountable to keeping their um, quality of dog that they're training as well as the quality of instruction that they're implementing um, to a certain standard. Um, so that's something definitely to, to keep in mind. Um, on the next slide, these are additional standards uh, that the leader dog has implemented on top of um, the IGDF standards. Um, so, um, these are specifically to leader dog, the first of which being independent self-care self skills, um, being able to stay away from home for an extended period of time in a hotel-like setting, um, again, for the, you know, the residential training that happens here at leader dog, it takes about three weeks. Um, socially appropriate behavior, we've touched on this again. Um, when coming into class, though, you will be with people, people from different parts of the world um, with different backgrounds. So we wanna make sure everyone is respectful and kind. A solid work ethic. Uh, we have a limited amount of time to pass on a lot of information and to practice a lot of different skills, some of which are skills that people have not even, you know, been exposed to at all. Um, so we expect clients to work hard and kind of be motivated and we wanna make the best use of our, use of our time. Um, 16 years or older, um, that is the minimum age to apply, and then seizure-free for at least six months. <clears throat> so before we get into the application pro process, um, we're just going to talk about our program requirements, all program requirements. Again, um, 16 years of age is the minimum age requirement to apply. Um, must be legally blind. There are some minor exceptions to this um, for our o and our o &M program. Uh, we sometimes are able to accept uh, clients who are low vision or someone with a progressive diagnosis that may le eventually lead to blindness. Um, these are kind of evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, if you have any questions regarding that, you can always um, to call our client services to ask. Um, next would be six months seizure-free, which we, we touched on as well, uh, we need medical proof of that, as well as the ability to administer own medications and self-care skills. Um, we do not have medical staff on property here during guide dog classes, um, so it's important that clients are able to administer their own medications and self-care skills. Um, the only time that we do have medical personnel on campus is when we do our week-long summer camp 
um, with the teenagers that come in here. Um, and that's only really to monitor medication. Um, we still expect the campers themselves to self-administer. And then again, the ability to walk for 30 minutes is stained at least four times. Um, we do do a lot of walking in the guide dog program because we wanna make sure we're getting in uh, those practice reps while we're, uh, while we're here on campus. And while the instructors are around, um, we tell them this is the perfect time. This is when you're supposed to make mistakes. We'd rather you make all the mistakes here so that you're better prepared going forward and going home when you leave. All right, the next slide, we're gonna talk about the application process. But before we do, I'm just gonna point out this adorable puppy that's in this photo right here. Um, this, is, uh, this is a golden retriever Labrador cross puppy. And this is actually the 20,000th puppy born at uh, Leader Dogs for the Blind. Uh, his name is Legacy. And I am currently, along with two other instructors, raising Legacy as a puppy. Um, so not only, not only am I an instructor in my nine to five gig, but I'm also volunteering as a puppy raiser outside of working hours. Um, but Legacy just celebrated his one year birthday uh, this past Friday and whatnot. So he's, he's doing great and he says hello. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the application process and the pieces of an application that's uh, submitted to leader dog for a guide dog uh, applicant. Um, this includes the application form. Um, applicants can request a hard copy or electronic co copy from client services. It's also found on our, uh, on our website, which is leaderdog.org. Um, consent to release information so we can reach out to your personal references and O&M specialists if listed. Again, the personal references um, for our o &M program, we require two. For the guide dog program, we, re we require three to five. A medical evaluation to be completed by a medical professional, uh, vision evaluation to be completed by medical or vision professional. Um, and then again, this video that I had kind of mentioned earlier, the travel video, um, the video is required to show the physical capability of ascending and descending stairs, showing uh, typical routes the person will travel, a variety of intersections and then showing the home environment. Um, and again, we strongly encourage um, and tell them that it is okay if there are mistakes in the video. Uh, we, we want to see how people problem solve. Um, it, it helps us in our matching process, making sure we put um, the best dog there. So the videos then are then sent to our admissions committee, which is a committee um, made up of members from various departments um, who then review the, uh, the uh, applications and they make a decision whether to approve, um, deny, or sometimes they can also put a client on hold if they need to gather more information about a client specific, you know, in regards to a spe specific situation. So next, if you, uh, if you want to apply for any of the three of the programs of our guide dog training, uh, we have the information up on the screen here. Um, this is the information to our client services department. They are at client services, one word, at leaderdog.org, or you can call 888-777-5332. Um, and then again, at the website is, you know, www.leaderdog.org forward slash apply. Um, these are, this is the best way to get in touch with our client services. If you have any further uh, questions or need any or have any other, want to gather any more information about the application process. Um, all our programs also are free and, and public transportation is provided free of charge, either air or train travel to our facilities. So that is provided at no cost to our client base. All right, so I would now like to introduce Audrey Demet. Audrey Demet uh, graduated from the University of Arizona with a nursing degree. Shortly after she began her career, she was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative retinal disease. Despite vision loss, Audrey learned to forge her way in a career that she loved and worked for 30 years as a nurse in a variety of settings. Currently, she works as a health education specialist and consultant for the National Research and Training Center on Blindness and Low Vision, as well as a content writer for the Vision Aware website on subjects related to health and vision loss. She lives in Peachtree, Georgia with her husband and beautiful leader dog, Delta. 
and she has graciously agreed to share some of her experiences, both with cane training and with guide dog training. So hi, Audrey, thank you so much. Hi, Leslie, thank you for that um, introduction. So I have been a leader dog client since I think about 2009. And at that time, my vision had gotten to the point where I knew I needed to do something about personal safety. I had gone through a period of time of falling a lot, spraining ankles, and eventually breaking, breaking an ankle. <laughs> um, and it had gotten to the point where, one, that was very inconvenient to always be you know, recovering from an injury. But two, I had gotten really fearful about going out at all on my own. And um, this was a really big change for me kind of mentally and emotionally just to not, not feel safe enough to go out and about anymore. You know, I had not driven a car in many, many years. It wasn't really that. It was just, can I keep myself safe out there? And I felt like the world was growing, um, you know, in in hazards for me, I guess I would say, um, as my vision declined. And there was even a part of me, you know, that sort of denies that, that it's really vision related. You, you sort of tell yourself at first, oh, I'm just, I'm, I've gotten to be pretty clumsy person, you know? Um, but then in your heart of hearts, you actually know, yes, this really is vision related. And so after my big injury and surgery, I had a reconstructive ankle surgery, um, after I recovered from that, I got really serious about seeking some resources. And um, I, knew, I, I knew very little actually about white cane training, but I, I thought that that was the solution to my problem. However, in my state, uh, there was a two year waiting list to get services. And in fact, the first time I called for these services, they told me that my husband made too much money and I did not qualify for these services. So they were actually uh, using um, means, you know, criteria for this. And it was really terrible, awful. I ended up writing letters to the director of blind services for the state of Georgia. My husband and I got on the internet and said, gee, there's got to be another way. Let's try to figure this out. And it was not long before I found Leader Dog on the internet. And, you know, the first thing that caught my attention was, of course, the O&M program. And at that time, you were calling it Accelerated O&M. You know, you could get these skills under your belt in a week. Well, that's kind of how I operate, you know, got to get it done, got to get it done. So <laughs> uh, we, we just put ourselves into it and, it, you know, started the process. And before I knew it, I got a call to come to Leader Dog to, for one week to train with a white cane. And I'll tell you, it was very exciting. It was not scary for me. It was, what was scary for me was being out and about without any way of keeping myself safe or the scary thing of being stuck at home all the time. That was scary to me. <laughs> so off I went for a week. Um, I came home with my very first cane and really with this renewed confidence, like, okay, everything's gonna be okay. I can do this. Um, the instructors were phenomenal. The program was phenomenal. I, I, I have a lot of respect for what Leader Dogs does, not just because I've benefited from them greatly, but because as professionals, they do it all so well. And, um, you know, I, I, they're deserving of my support anyway. So I, you know, I try to do what I can for Leader Dog because um, I think they're just doing an amazing job and an amazing work. So I came home and actually they did an exit interview before I came home and asked, well, what do you think? Do you want to? Um, pursue a guide dog. I'm not sure if they asked that directly, but anyway, it came up in the exit interview. And I said, yes, I did. Absolutely. I had gotten the bug, you know, um, was familiar with other people raising puppies and um, always thought if I'm going to be blind, I want to have a cool dog <laughs> because I'm kind of a dog person and um, just loved the idea of it. So it wasn't but a few months later, they said, well, go home and practice your, your cane skills and um, we will be in touch with you as we work on getting a match for you. In a few months time, 
I got that call and it was sort of like getting the call that you're adopting a child and the child's ready to go home or something. It was very exciting. Um, so off I went back to Leader Dog again. And this at this point, you know, the campus was familiar, so I didn't feel out of sorts or disoriented. Um, the staff was familiar to me, which made it very welcoming and very easy to, to get around and to navigate that place. Um, because I'd been there before. And that training was, I think, a 26 day training with my first guide dog, Sophie, who was a beautiful golden retriever. Um, and I loved every bit of the training, everything from meeting the dogs to taking care of my dog to meeting the other blind people or the people with vision impairment. We, we, became fast friends under the circumstances because you're all kind of in it together. You're, you know, there's some challenges. There's a struggle with the schedule and trying to understand your dog and learning so many new things at once. Um, but I really enjoyed that whole process. And I thought the residential program really did give you that time away from all other distractions to really focus on your dog. And uh, I loved that. I think it was really effective in, well, preparing us to go home together, really. So that was my first guide dog, Sophie. So I came home and, um, oh, well, at the time that I, that I first got services from Leader Dog, the, the cane, I was working at a school as a school nurse. And I had recently tripped over a flatbed um, cart that a teacher had like art supplies or something loaded on and she parked it outside the clinic door. And when I came out the clinic door, I fell flat onto that thing and practically impaled my chest on whatever. I don't know what it was, but anyway, I hurt myself at work. And so they were very concerned. And I said, okay, don't worry, don't worry. I'm gonna get a cane, you know? So when I brought my cane home, the principal, at one of the staff meetings said, do you wanna to talk to the staff about this cane situation? And I said, oh yeah, I should, I should do that. So I did, and it was really good because I'd worked there for several years already and many people did not realize that I was as visually impaired as I was. And so telling them, okay, nothing's changed. I didn't go and have some you know, accident or something. I'm just telling you it's, it's time for this tool and you'll see me using it around the school. And if the kids ask questions, here's what we can talk about and what we can tell them. And so in that way, the whole school community became very aware of, well, my vision for one thing, the tools that I began to use, even in the clinic, like um, a CCTV and magnifiers and special glasses and other special adaptive equipment. Once I felt like I could use the cane publicly, I felt like I could use all those other things publicly, it, kind of coming out of the closet, so to speak, because... Um, you know, up until that point, you if you were visually impaired on a job, you were best to hide that that disability, you know, for as long as you could. Well, I just knew I couldn't do that any longer. So I jumped in with both feet. We introduced the cane to the school and the kids. And of course, they all had questions and how does it work and blah, blah, blah. But the beauty of it, what the people didn't realize was that I could now walk to and from work get there without having to wait on the curb for a ride. I could walk around the building without tripping on backpacks. Um, you know, it, it just really gave me such a sense of confidence and um, peace of mind. And I soon began to feel like, gee, I'm afraid to go out without my cane. I feel more comfortable with my cane than without my cane. And that was a real flip. And then when I brought Sophie back, I brought her back to school with me. And again, we had sort of an introduction to guide dog life and a guide dog on the workforce, you know, at work type of meeting with the staff. And then the staff were, were um, asked to talk to the children about, you know, Miss Demet's guide dog and what the rules were. And everybody learned together. And it was a very exciting time, really. Um, it opened up a lot of conversation about disabilities and abilities and um, the differences between us and you know what does it mean that I can that I can't see and but I see a little bit and you know I have sort of that confusing vision where well it's progressive and it's a lot worse now I mean I'm kind of in the end stages but there were times when people would look at me and say things like well you don't look blind 
Or, you know, are you training that dog? Because you don't look blind. <laughs> I got that a lot. And, um, and I would always say, you know, yes, I am training her because they are always in training. She's always learning new things with me. <laughs> anyway, um, but Sophie became kind of a mascot at school. She taught the stu students a lot of things. And um, she went to school with me for almost three years. And things had, during that time, gotten to the point where I had some other job opportunities and it was getting harder and harder to do my job at the school, like getting to emergencies outside. I would have to grab all these to-go um, equipments, grab Sophie, get her in harness and get out to the football field where somebody may have you know, cut their leg on the bleachers. So I knew it was time that I wouldn't be able to do this forever. But I was okay with that because I had other opportunities. And then Sophie went on um, to another job with me. It was actually for a vision rehab agency. And I was working as the adjustment counselor and diabetic educator with other clients who were visually impaired. And that was a great environment for both of us. Um, we sort of thrived there just because people got what, what you know, my situation was. They understood guide dogs. It was all just great. Um, and then um, to go full circle, you know, the time came when Sophie decided she did not want to work anymore. And she was healthy. She didn't have any other problems. She had been a stellar worker. I didn't quite understand what was going on myself, but I, of course, called Leader Dog and their rep came out to evaluate Sophie. And I did not expect her words to be, I think Sophie wants to retire. I expected that she was going to help me burn a fire under her again and get her going again because I thought she had lots more years to give um, but you know that's the difference between the a client and the GDMIs they they see these things and they recognize what it is for what it is so I got the sad news that Sophie was probably ready to retire and that was just um, it kind of reeled me for a while and I said no no you know I I denied it. I said, give me a few more weeks. You know, let me try this. Let me try that. I'll just keep doing everything you did for these last few days. This trainer stayed with me for a couple of days in Peachtree City, Georgia, and um, kept working on Sophie and nothing really worked. So she said, well, let's do this. Let's shoot your video <laughs> before I leave. And we'll, you can keep working on this. And then you just call us when you want to initiate the you know, the next application. And she was smart to do that because, yeah, I mean, I would have had to find another way to do that video. And anyway, it, it all went very efficiently. And, um, before, and then in the next few months, I retired Sophie. It was absolutely heart wrenching. I flew her back to South Dakota and gave her back to her puppy raisers who had always told me that they were interested in having her back. And I really loved that for her. Um, I was about to be a new grandma and I had pledged myself to do childcare and I didn't think I could do a new dog, new grandkids and all of that, um, you know, <laughs> successfully. So that was a really hard decision, but I felt like I needed to do right by Sophie and that is what I did. And she's very happy, she's still alive and she's healthy. And then, so Delta came into my life and um, I did go through that transitions class. And I remember my most pre predominant feeling was, how can I get a new dog? I, it's, I'm betraying Sophie. It's like being um, like cheating on your first guide dog or something. Like you, you feel like it's, you can't do that to them, you know? And it's, it's a little irrational and it's a lot of grief and just sadness about it all. But um, I got over it and I jumped course, jumped into that training and made the most of it. And Delta and I are still together today. She is working just fine. She's going to be five years old in April. And again, I feel like leader dog gave me this amazing dog and the gift of mobility. Um, and you know, it's hard to put a price on that, but Thank you, that's, Audrey. Yeah, that's what Leader Dog does. Thank you. That is so nice to hear. It's always great to hear from clients who have gone through it and experienced it, and especially you have gone through the O&M program and the guide dog training and can speak to how important 
uh, both of those pieces are. So thank you so much for sharing your story. We certainly appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> All right, so I know we're pretty much out of time here. Um, so I'm just gonna flip to the last slide with our contact information on it because I am happy to help answer any other questions that you may have regarding our summer experience camp. Um, I will say quickly that we're not exactly sure if we're going to be able to hold the in-person camp this year. We're still kind of evaluating everything with COVID-19, but we will for sure be hosting a virtual camp. So please just check out our website with all of the updates of what's going on, or please feel free to email me uh, directly. I'm happy to help. And my name and email is leslie.hoskins at leaderdog.org. Um, and I know we have three minutes. Um, so there's a couple of questions and then I know everybody probably wants their code too to end their day. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I saw, Eric, that maybe you might want to uh, answer was about dog ownership. Certainly. If clients own their dogs. Yeah, so um, the ownership policy varies from school to school, uh, specifically for leader dog. Um, we have a one year um, at the end of one year after the um, student and dog graduate um, the ownership of the dog transfers over to the student and to their name, um, unless they have been placed on any kind of probationary um, period for anything. But yeah, after one, after one year, the dog officially becomes um, owned by the, uh, by the client. Somebody else asked, um, can people from Canada, Canada use the two services? And clients from Canada are welcome to all of our programs and services. So certainly, yeah, we've got a lot of Canadians with dogs out there right now. So yes. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, if a student is interested in attending camp, however, is unable to see stoplights. Will this prohibit the student from potentially obtaining a guide dog? Absolutely not. So um, most of our clients can't see stoplights um, and are legally blind. So that is not a deterrent at all. I would strongly encourage them to come to camp if ever possible, um, because you learn so much about guide dog expectations and if it's going to be a good fit for you and really start building those O&M skills early on. You know, we can always print out the International Guide Dog Federation standards for anybody to take back to their own m instructor um, and say, hey, these are the things I need to work on. These are my goals for the next couple of years so that I can get a guide dog when I go to college or whatever the, the goal is. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I know. Do you want to do one more? And then. Oh, uh, was there. I'm trying to scroll thing through there there is the ever-present question of people who want to be either puppy raisers or want mm -hmm. to find out if they can adopt puppies yes um so all that information the best place to go is our website to find out how to be a puppy raiser or how to adopt our career change dogs is what we call them they just chose a different path in life um so there's lots of information about that on our website or again please email me directly i'm happy to guide you in the right direction Okay. Um, and I also went through the chat and um, copied um, uh, the questions and put them in one document. So that way you have them. And then once we, um, we can share the email list with you of the attendees and you can just do like, a, if you want a mass email with the answers so that everybody hears it. Um, that, yeah, that would probably be helpful for you uh, and for them. So um, yes, thank you so much for all this awesome information. We will definitely have, every, uh, every, have you guys back. Um, the closing code is, um, and anyway, like I said, thank you so much. We will um, have you guys back because there's, there's so much information. It's hard to put it in right into this one little spot. And um, and so just so just so you know, attendees will be uh, receiving an email with a survey. Um, and so please, attendees, you know, fill out the survey. Let us know what what worked for you, what things, uh, what we could do better, and if you have any other ideas or you know anything like that that we can um, put together as a webinar or as a blog or article um, to help you. So, um, but with that, I, I would love to thank Leslie and Eric again, and Audrey, thank you so much for your, um, for sharing your story. Um, lots of wonderful comments about your story. And um, it was, uh, my heart was breaking when you said you had to <laughs> retire.
retire her and had to go oh my god and had to take her back that just I understand that just that broke my heart so um you know I I feel for you but I'm I'm glad that um that you were you know love that you loved her so much <laughs> and, uh, and that she you guys took care of each other <laughs> so that's good well it, and it is just part of it and you're gonna you wake up one day and you realize yeah this is part of it you know yeah uh, i know but doesn't make it any easier no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. so thank you again and um everyone will we'll see you um at the next webinar so be sure to um keep checking our calendar and um uh, keep joining us thanks so much for attending Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a good